I stole this from the Wrestling Classics message board, but would it be conceivable in 1984 that Ric Flair spent more money on spilt liquor than Buddy Landell made? I mean, if you do the math, it's starting to make sense. And I pulled up the thread here, and they actually did do the math. <laughs> Honest, in 1984, honestly and truthfully, no. If you took the word spilled out of, of that sentence, then that's a new equation. I was at Buddy Land in 1984, Buddy was with us in Louisiana, right? Yeah. And I know what we made, and I know what his position on the card was. I would say that Buddy had to, well, but see, here's the thing. There's the fines. <laughs> But well, let's <laughs> let's say that the Buddy was never fined by Bill Watts for any infractions of being late or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, Buddy had to be a sixty or sixty-five thousand dollar guy because even the opening match guys were having some thousand dollar weeks. We made about a hundred, and we and we were main event, but not we weren't in main events through the entire year because a couple of times after we'd come out on the short end of a program with a babyface team. They would give us somebody else like the PYTs that we, it was designed for us to have a few go rounds with them and ultimately get over. They wouldn't get the last word, so we'd get strong for the rock and roll to come back, blah, blah, blah. So we weren't in all the main events, but, um, but he, yeah, easily. And so Flair, in, and especially in 1984, the Carolinas were not doing record business. But having said that, if you took spilled liquor out, I can, I can believe that Ric Flair could have spent a thousand dollars a week on on bar tabs easily you want me to read you some of this the math they tried to figure out okay okay really interesting the story has been sampled in rap songs and legend has it buddy never fully recovered from the brutality of that burn <laughs> but could this claim have actually been true let's run some numbers for ease of math i'm using current day numbers and if someone wants to they can adjust for inflation I believe Rick made this claim in 1985, and therefore we are comparing the amount Rick spent on spilled liquor, also known as <laughs> unconsumed liquor that was splashed out of the glass and not into anyone's mouth, <laughs> to Buddy Landell's 1984 earnings. I believe Landell was in Mid-South in 1984, which is correct. Some reasonable assumptions. Rick Flair went out to bars 300 times in 1984. At each bar, he ordered 99 kamikaze. <laughs> if I recall his 30 for 30 correctly, Rick said he drank about 10 beers and five cocktails a day. It's been said that in order to keep up his image, but also in order to function, Rick would... Sir, <laughs> uh, come, come on, we, we, this man's had health issues recently. We shouldn't be laughing, but this is interesting. Go ahead. Rick would toss every other drink into a plant or something. <laughs> so in order to drink 10 beers and five kamikazes, he's tossing another 10 and five into the shrubbery. Also the remaining 89 kamikazes, you figure about another five worth are getting lost in the splashing from people clinking glasses and going cheers or simply from knocking them over in raucous party fashion. You also have the fact that Rick would pick up the tab for others at these bars. Drinks are on the champ. Woo! Now, whether I swear, or not I, swear, I swear to God, by the way, I did get an email recently. I don't have it in front of me from a guy who said that his, his mother told him stories about when Ric Flair bought everybody in the place drinks at Cheers in Johnson City, Tennessee after a show at Freedom Hall. So that, that, that has happened on more than one occasion. Now, whether or not he actually paid what he owed versus stiffing the bar is another subject, but for our purposes, we are treating this as a liability to Rick and under the... I, I, I do not have any evidence that he ever stiffed a bar. Uh, Maybe me, a credit card company later on, I don't know, but I think all the bartenders, and the bartenders are good, got well taken care of. Let me fast forward a little bit here. Out of those many drinks bought for others, let's say an average of 10 drinks worth got knocked over or sloshed out of glasses. <laughs> Or if others were doing like Rick and tossing them aside when no one was looking, and as some have admitted to, spilled that way. So that's 10 spilled beers and 10 spilled kamikazes and 10 spilled miscellaneous drinks per night for 300 nights. I'm presuming these are kamikaze shots and therefore cheaper than a double or a full well drink. So let's say that in 2019 dollars, 
The average cost of each beer in Kamikaze is $5. Let's say the miscellaneous spill drinks average $5. $5 times 30 drinks equals $150 in spill drinks per night. $150 times 300 nights equals $45,000 in spilled liquor. Would Buddy Landell have made more than that in 1984 dollars? Wasn't it J.J. Dillon in his book that claimed that most wrestlers were earning way less than they claimed? Buddy wasn't a big star in 1984, as far as I know. I think it's possible Rick's claim was accurate, and this post was made by a gentleman named Vulture. Well, I just went over Buddy's estimated salary. And, and yeah, and J.J. Dillon is right also. Most wrestlers didn't make any near what anywhere near what they said they made. However, I've heard buddy in public in 1984 bragging that he made more money than the president of the United States, which at that time I think was 120 something grand. So he was still, he was lying, but he was still making, um, it, it, by the way, he did that. He got mad that we were in, in the Dallas airport eating at the fucking buffet gimmick. And he got mad at the guy for some reason. And he was behind me in the line. I'm trying to hurry up. And he's like, okay, brother, no problem. I make more money than the president of the United States last year. By God. <laughs> I once heard you use that line. Did you get that from buddy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Of course. And, and I used it in a wrestling promo situation rather than telling somebody at the fucking buffet. Right. I hope. I don't know. Possibly I didn't. Um, but yeah, well, okay, hold on here now. Well, let's just go. We're just going to go to the old inflation calculator. Wait a minute. I got my, hold on. Just talk to the people for one second. We are doing mathematics here, ladies and gentlemen, to figure out the spilled drink value. Well, no, no, no. Now we're not on spilled drinks now. We're just, we're just, I am saying because of the, Midnight Express's earnings of just under $100,000 in 1984 that Buddy Landell, in, in, since he was there for pretty much the whole year, I believe, with us, in his placement on the card in Mid-South Wrestling would have probably made somewhere around 65 or 70 I would bet, right? Because, I, I mean, I saw some of these checks. I know that the, 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 Pat Rose, when he was – just an opening match guy, but business was good during warm weather that, that summer. He was remarking he was having a thousand dollar week. Right? So hold on here a second. In nineteen eighty four, let's say Buddy made sixty five thousand dollars. Being on the card and featured as Butch Reed's sidekick and in some important matches. Yeah, especially and, as the year went on. Yes. Uh that today is uh equal to just under one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So that's what a, 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 a upper mid card heel was making in 1984 in Mid South Wrestling, and I mean, I, once again, I don't have Buddy's books, but I know what mine was. Let's go for a hundred. What were the main event guys making? That is the equivalent today of two hundred forty five thousand nine hundred fifty five dollars in today's money. So yes, res but wrestlers always back in the 70s, you know. Uh, would, when they were interviewed by the news on TV or in newspapers, they was, oh, I make six figures or I make a hundred thousand. If you sa said you made a hundred thousand dollars back in those days, that sounded pretty fucking good. So they would say that Lawler actually, he did a number of interviews in the, in the mid seventies and his world title matches coming up or whatever, saying that, you know, wrestling was a big business for him and he would probably make 150 grand that year. And actually with what I know now about having percentages of of things, he may have not even been embellishing that much. Let's see. And uh, hold on here. In terms of the Ric Flair show at the bar, you talked about recently on the show that you would usually go back to your hotel room, get some pizza, get some chips, maybe hang out with some female companion. Friends. And that would Friends. be the night. Did you ever experience the Ric Flair show in the bar? Uh, no, only a couple of times in passing. Especially, like if I was going down to the... Uh, to the hotel front desk to get some change for the Coke machine back before they took bills, things like that. You would see some of the carnage erupting. But, I, but and, and I mean, you know, and, and I rode with, with Rick a few times when I was on the, the creative team, the booking committee, whatever they were calling it in WCW at that point. But no, I, I didn't, I didn't get involved in those type of things, but I will say now, just for example, teen, 
I saw one of Ric Flair's checks during the spring of 1986. This was not Ooh, a, a this was not snooping. This was an inadvertent glance. <laughs> On Wednesdays at Crockett's office uh, on Briar Bend Drive in Charlotte, we would do the promos, as we've talked about, local promos all day from like 9 in the morning until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And that's also where uh, we would get paid. I mean, you know, for the underneath guys, Denny Brown, they'd bring the checks to Raleigh or whatever on Wednesday night or where we were, so, uh, whatever. But for the guys that were the, the top baby faces and heels that did local promos, you would get your check – on Wednesday, when they were ready, about noonish or whatever, you'd go in, and one of the secretaries, there were three nice old ladies, uh, they would have it for you. So I went in one time and asked for my check, and she said, oh, yes, just one second. We're just finishing them up now. And as she turns to go through this stack of envelopes, I just, I'm pittering around, look down at the desk, and there is Ric Flair's check. And it's not an envelope, Right. And I'm, oh, shit. And I look at the total real quick, and I about piss myself because <laughs> I'd never seen a wrestling check that size at that point. And then I take mine and go on about my merry way. And, and the, I think I, I used to take the midnights to them also. But we looked at ours. That was during the midnight rock and roll, the first run. So this is like March of 86-ish or whatever, where houses were great. We made, I believe, that week with the Midnight Rock and Roll match being underneath Flair and Dusty, uh, our check was like 4500 bucks a piece, right? Rick's was for 14000 some odd dollars. Holy I didn't shit. get real fucking close, right? So that was for a week, and he had been the main event when we'd been on. And, of course, it's a, it's a tag team match where you're splitting money five ways versus a single main event where you're splitting it two ways, and one's the world champion and the other one's the fucking booker. So but there was a disparity. But that $14,000 week, and, and this wasn't without pay-per-view. There was no pay-per-view involved. This, there wasn't even a Starcade or a goddamn big stadium show. It was just fucking regular business. That's the equal of $32,642.99 today. Well, if he was making that in the spring, how much would you guess he was making during the bash in the summer? Well, I, I, you know, here's the thing. I've sh this was printed in the Midnight Express book. We got a check for $17,000 for the 14 bashes. And the, there were only 14 Great American bashes. The rest of the dates that summer were just regular shows and we were paid, you know, on the regular checks. But then at the end of the month period, they paid all the bashes in one because everybody was expecting 14 starcades, right? And it didn't work out that way, but our total for, and it's on my wall and it's on the book and I can't see either, but I can't remember, but I'll just round it off. Our total for the month of July, me and the midnight express was $22,000. So that today is $51,296. That's what we made for the month of July. Now, I refuse to believe this, but since Flair's check was three times what ours was, when, <laughs> when, uh, when I accidentally saw his and we were the semifinal to his main event every night, then if we took that fucking equation and said, okay, Flair made three times as much as us in the month of July, that would be $66,000 then and $153,888 now. Wow. Well, I don't believe that because <laughs> I think people would have heard about that fucking check. However, since we made $22,000, there's no doubt in my mind that Ric Flair, the world champion who was on the main event of every card we were semifinal and some a couple of times, a couple of times we were main event because we were in with Dusty and Magnum and Baby Doll and the cage had to go on last because you had to put the cage up, right? But Ric Flair was the advertised main event of every one of those. He had to make 40. He had to make 40. And and that's the equivalent of 93 grand. And I mean, you know, unless in, in once again, I can speak uh, with truth and documentation about my earnings. I have every fucking, I have everything written down I ever fucking made, right? 
So I can, without fear of contradiction, give you these statistics, and then I can look at other people who were featured on the same cards in sometimes more prominent positions, and you mean to tell me that Jim Crockett was paying Ric Flair the same thing as the Midnight Express in 1986? No, especially during the one time that I did see something, he paid him three times as much. Of course, those were for a couple of big sellout houses and Rick was on top. And when the midnight express and the rock and roll express sold out Columbia, South Carolina, the township auditorium for the first time since I believe they said 1978, it was an actual legitimate sellout in Columbia. The first time in eight years, normally you made it two or three or four or $500 in Columbia, depending on where you were on the card and what the house was at, at best. Right. We got $1,000 a piece because that was something special. He said, here, you guys did something that all my other stars haven't been able to do in eight years. Here's a fucking thousand bucks a piece. You were 80 miles from your house. Had one 15-minute match. I'll take that. But a lot of times you would, you know, the promoter had the, since he made it all up anyway, he made up the formulas and the fucking uh, uh, mathematical equations to figure out how much money you got paid. So if he wanted to fucking take care of you because you had done something good for the territory, he would. So I can't, I can't imagine that Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes as uh, the equal top star to Flair on the babyface side and the booker. You think he ain't making twice what we're making at least. So if, if you figure that, then that means that, Dusty and Flair were both making, you know, 400 grand plus for 1986. Where do you think 86 ranks for Ric Flair? You know, at least until he went to the WWF, because obviously they start having pay-per-views in 87, 88, but it's not like they really have much strength. And then there's minimal merchandising. Do you think 86 is the peak for Ric Flair or Crockett promotions? Boy, it, it, well, but see, also remember when the territories, when he had the belt first couple of years, the, when the territories were still strong and he was going to Japan and working for Baba on a regular basis, because Baba was paying him more than Crockett was, and it, it, he'd go to St. Louis and get a five or $6,000 payoff in one night for those sellouts, as we've got documentation on. Yeah, we know those payoffs, yeah. So, you know, Dallas, all through did Dallas. Did Dallas pay him well, or was Dallas cheap with him? Well, he, he, what was it they said one time about when you go to work for Bill Watts, you'll make half what you should make and twice as much as anybody else will pay you. When you're <laughs> in the main event with the promoter's son in Texas Stadium in front of 40,000 fucking people and $400,000 house, he probably made out okay, regardless. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and that was 1984. But, and I'm trying to think, um, well, we know that in equivalent payoffs, uh, when when Bruno and Zabisco did the Shea Stadium uh, mega house, that was four hundred something grand. Uh, Bruno's payoff was twenty nine grand, and Zabisco quit over getting twenty two. And Ric Flair was the NWA champion on a four hundred thousand dollar house in Dallas, Texas. It didn't have anywhere near the rent <laughs> that they did in Shea Stadium. And was kind enough to do the job and and put the promoter's son over in memory of his deceased son. I, you know, my God. There was, uh, the entire 80s, there was significant money changing hands in a lot of these territories. And then when you go back to the 70s, before Rick, Terry Funk, you know, admits he, he, he quit the NWA title basically because he had gotten he'd split up with Vicky and wanted to go back and straighten that out which he did and they were together another 40 years or whatever but that was more important to him but it, when you're making a quarter of a, what's what was $250,000 let's just say and that's not an awkward uh, or outrageous figure for the NWA champion to have been making in the late 70s let's put in 1977 and say 250 grand is light that's a million fifty, uh, $1,054,000 today. But you were, you had no life. You were always on the road and you, you know, it, that's why everybody except everybody except Luthez and Ric Flair eventually wanted to give the belt back. Yeah. I was, just, in, <laughs> I, I was just reading Steve Verrier's Gene Kaniski book and it's the same thing. He eventually was like, okay, I'm ready to go home. I can't do yeah. this anymore. Yeah. 
but that was the mo- that, that was the most sought after job in wrestling because it from a period of what 19, 1972 through 1982 the three highest paid guys in the business would have been the NWA champion Bruno Sammartino and Andre the Giant I mean, if, 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 let's, let's, well, in, uh, when I say in the business, Enoki and Baba was a whole different fucking economy over there. Well, Baba but, was a league of his own. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Enoki burned through his <laughs> and whoever else's money with a great regular, but you know, besides the, the kingpins of Japanese wrestling, the three highest paid guys for that, the decade of the seventies were Andre Bruno and the NWA champion. And if that was, and I, I mean, we've we've talked about Bruno would have almost had to been over three hundred grand without seeing these guys' tax returns. And can you imagine if he decided, you know what, I'm going to work a full schedule this year? Oh, good lord! Yeah, and that that was not doing spot shows. Yeah, that was the major towns, and then every now and then he would go into Japan for Baba, or he would go to Indianapolis. But it was Bruno just picking and choosing what he wanted to do. And then w- when you had, uh, as we've talked about, when you had a million dollar town that would gross a million dollars a year and, and the booker or top star had a piece of it, you know, I don't know. Memphis didn't gross probably a million dollars most years, although that would only be an average of 20 grand, uh, you know, 50 times a year. But even still then back in the seventies, probably didn't gross a million. But, uh, you know, when Lawler ended up in the early eighties with 10% and they started doing those big houses, you could see where he could easily easily do between 100 and 150 just on his piece of Memphis. So there, there, there was money in wrestling. It just, everybody didn't get it, and it became the old cliche that, oh, you know, all the guys got fucked around and taken advantage of. Well, many did. Many more did than didn't, but a lot of guys under this shady fly-by-night system made a fucking fortune. Whether they all kept it is up for debate. But you, in, in the old days, under this old system, and with many things happening in cash, you could make a fucking fortune if you got to be a main event guy and figured into a fucking promotion to a territory. 